leaving the drought. We are on in a series of leaving the drought, part four. Uh, we want God to do a new thing. Isaiah 43, 19 says, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the what? How many of us here are ready for God to do a new thing? I'm talking about a new thing in your life. A new thing in your church. A new thing in the workplace. A new thing in, at home. You're a bunch of liars. I knew I was going to get to call you out on that. Because you know that doing a new thing is not your favorite thing. If I announce, whenever the pastor, I've gotten to where I kind of enjoy it a little bit. It's a guilty pleasure of mine. When I come up here and announce we're doing something new, the first emotion you feel is not excitement, it's worry. We love the idea of doing a new thing, but let's get real. We don't like the work it takes to do a new thing. I mean, we grew up doing church a certain way. We grew up being trained on a job a certain way. We grew up eating our eggs a certain way. We grew up dealing with problems a certain way. Doing a new thing is actually very hard for us. I'm reading a fascinating book called The Power of Habit. I highly recommend. What it brings out is that the quality of your life is determined by your habits. It is determined by your habits. And habits are hard to change. Do you know why? It's because we create in our brain something called neural, neural pathways. Neural pathways. And, and what is a neural pathway? Well, it's this highway in, in our brains of nerve cells that transmit messages. And so the more you travel this highway in, in your thought process, you know, the more uh, your, 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 your thought impulsive action, the more a, a, a thought leads to an action, the more solid that highway gets in your brain. The more you travel it, the more solid and defined it gets and harder to break. You can actually change your brain chemistry because of your habits. I mean, they've studied this. It's true. When we go to food or cigarettes for comfort or drinking, it's because we have a neural pathway in our brain. If we tend to give up whenever opposition comes, we've got a neural pathway in our brain. If we always isolate when we get depressed, if we always feel this overwhelming desire that we've got to control everything, it's because you've got an expressways in your brain. It's why we often respond with a certain action before we even think about doing it. Man, the inside of your brain looks like downtown New York City. You got so many neural pathways and you got so many exits and, and, and highways and expressways and you got it all over your brain. No wonder we don't get excited about new things. That's why we don't get excited about new music. You know, I remember as a young man, I thought I was quite the connoisseur of good music. And my parents had another opinion. Richie, this music's terrible. And I remember thinking, you know, man, I'm never going to be closed-minded like my parents until I had kids. <laughs> and now I'm like, what these kids listen to is terrible. <laughs> we don't like new things. It's why we don't like new fashions. We don't like new trends. We, we don't like a new supervisor who has a new way of doing something. We've been doing the same way the past 40 years. Have you noticed in church one of our favorite ways of describing someone is, um, oh, you know so-and-so, that's just how he or she is. 
But friends, no one is born negative. That's not just the way someone is. No one is born controlling. No one is born prejudiced. No one comes out of the womb stingy. These are things and behaviors we learn over a lifetime of making decisions and creating neural pathways in our brain. We have conditioned our brain, and the way we've conditioned it is bringing about the life that we now live. So it's easy to shout amen when, 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 when we read God's going to do a new thing, but to actually do it, not so much. Do you get excited about new road construction? <laughs> yeah, you want the new road. You don't want the construction. We want the new life. We just don't want to do the work that it's going to take to begin a new life. It's going to take work. You see, if you want God, now this is, this is key. If you leave with only one thing today, I hope and pray it's this. If, if, you, want, if, if, if you want God to do a new thing in your life, you got to be willing to do something different in it. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness, in rivers, in the desert. We've been talking about leaving a drought. We've been looking at Elijah. We all find ourselves in droughts, times when instead of thriving, we're just kind of surviving, when, when the home life is struggling, when the job is, is, is just kind of limping along, when our faith is really hurting. Whenever you read a text, Isaiah 43, 19, it's always important to study its context. Because we isolate verses often, we lose the meaning of the text. You know, that's why one of the worst things the translators ever did was put verses and chapters in there. Because you think because a chapter came to an end, that was the end of that thought, when really the idea and the thought may be going on for the next four chapters. It's important to study verse 19, its context, because when all you hear is verse 19, you're hearing what God wants to do, a new thing, hallelujah. What you're not hearing is how he's going to do it. We slap this verse on graduation cards. Oh, you're graduating. You see, God wants to do a new thing in your life. We give it to people who are going through promotions. See, God wants to do a new thing in your life. Isn't that great? But friends, Israel was not on their way to graduation. They were not about to get a promotion. Israel was on its way to exile. Good times were not coming for God to do this new thing. Hard times were coming. So the good news is God's like, I'm going to do a new thing in your life. Bad news, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. It wasn't easy for God to do a new thing in Israel. Friends, it's not going to be easy for God to do a new thing in your life. Leaving the drought is not easy. Israel had to believe that in spite of how hard the exile was, that, that what God was going to do was better than what they had. See, you need to believe that no matter how tough that new thing God wants to do in your life, no matter hard it may be, no matter how different it might be, it is better than what you currently have. You see, you need to believe that in spite of the way you were raised, in spite of how addicted you are, no matter how great the obstacles may be or how dry your desert is, God's going to do a new thing, and his new thing is better than your old thing. He says, I will make a way in the wilderness, and I'm going to pop up deserts in, uh, rivers in the desert. Hallelujah. If you're in a drought, God says, I can send rivers to your drought. Nothing is impossible with me. When you study the book of Isaiah, you discover that it's all about God one, wanting to bless his people, wanting to bless Israel, but Israel kept getting in the way of the blessing. Isaiah 59 2 really sums it up. Your iniquities have made a what? Iniquity is what? 
sin. Your sins, your decisions have made a separation between you and your God. You see, friends, God wasn't withholding his blessing from Israel. God's not some vindictive God who's just like, oh, you didn't do right, so here I'm going to get you. No, Israel was blocking the blessing through their disobedience. We need to understand, friends, our greatest barrier between us and God's blessing is us. It's not the preacher. It's not the teacher. It's not the spouse. It's not the boss. Whatever you are pointing at and saying, that's what's making me have a drought, uh uh-uh. It's you. And it's your response to what's happening in your life. And what is sad about Israel is not only did they block their own blessing, they blocked the blessing God wanted to give others through them. The devil doesn't just want to block you from the blessing of the Sabbath. He wants to block your coworkers, and he wants to block, block your friends, and so he is going to tempt you to say, well, you know what, it doesn't matter. The, de- the devil doesn't just want to block you from returning a faithful tithe because, friends, I can, I can speak to this from experience. When I am faithful with my tithe, God pours out his blessing. So when the devil tempts you, when he blocks your blessing of returning a faithful tithe, it's not just one, he doesn't want to just mess with your blessing, but he wants to cut evangelism budgets. He wants to eliminate mission from happening in the church. He wants to get pastors fired because people are not giving systematically and faithfully. Do you see? He doesn't just want to block your blessing. He wants to block the blessing of others. The devil doesn't just want to block your blessing of coming to church. He wants you to pass on your church attending inconsistency to your children so that they will pass it on to their children, so that they will pass it on to their children, so that they will pass it on to their children, so that not only is he blocking your blessing of coming to church on the Sabbath, he is blocking generations of coming to church on the Sabbath. He lays the sins of the parent upon their children. This is what you got to understand, family members. The entire family is affected by your sin. They're hurt. Even children in the third and the fourth generation. You see, the devil knew if he could block Israel's blessing, he would block the world from getting a blessing, and he does the same thing in the church today. But the good news, friends, is not only can we pass on our bad habits, hallelujah, we can pass on our good ones too. God says, I will bless you to Abraham, and I'm going to make your name great. Why? So that you will be a blessing. Friends, the more God can bless you, the more you will be a blessing to the world. God wants to bless you. You see, God blessed you with a good father and mother. Those of you who have a good father and mother, he blessed you with a good father and mother so that that you would be blessed and that one day you'll be a good father and mother and you'll bless your children who will uh, be good parents. God wants to bless your marriage, married couples, so that you'll bless your kids and that your kids will grow up and they have better chances of getting in a healthy marriage. God wants to bless your business employers so that you can bless your employees and they can bless their families and they can bless. You see how blessings just spread. And so when you listen to the devil and you let him block a blessing in your life, you are not just blocking your blessing. You are blocking thousands of blessings. God wants to turn you into a wellspring of blessing. God doesn't just want to end your drought. He wants you to be an agent through which he's going to end other people's droughts. You see, had Israel trusted in God, nothing could have stopped them. Sky would have been the limit. If we would really let go and let God, nothing could separate us from the blessings of God. That's what God is telling Israel in Isaiah 43, 16. He says, he who made a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters. God was saying, yeah, you're you're heading into exile. You're heading into captivity again. 
but remember what I did the last time you were in bondage. When Egypt's soldiers were behind you and encroaching on you and the Red Sea was in front of you, man, I paved a highway through the Red Sea. No, oh, it's not going to be easy. It's never easy. The exodus wasn't easy. Think about it. Israel had to believe in freedom while they were still in chains. You have to believe God's going to give you victory over that sin while you're still uh, uh, battling that sin. And then you had Pharaoh who kept changing his mind. You are going to have Pharaohs in your life that are going to keep changing their minds. Bottom line, freedom isn't easy. Leaving your drought is not easy. It takes persistence. It takes trying and trying again and, and failing and trying again and trying again. It means doing a new thing. But friends, and this is the key, if God is for you, who can be against you? You see, I don't care how small your cloud is uh, today, a rain, I hear the sound of a mighty rain. I don't care how little bit of oil and a tiny bit of flour you got, it's going to be enough. I don't care if you just got two fish and five loaves, Jesus can take that and turn it into a feast for a multitude. I don't care how long Lazarus has been in the tomb. In fact, I stayed gone two extra days so that when I showed up to rise him from the dead, you would know that it wasn't a fluke. It was the power of God. He made a way through the sea. Man, he made a way through the sea. Has God ever made a way for you? Amen. Has he ever made a way for you to pay a bill? You had no money to pay it. Has he ever made a way for you to get something fixed? You did not have the money to fix it. Has he ever made, made a way for you to keep your mouth shut when someone said something to you rude? Hallelujah, that was God making a way. I know that when I want to, when my first impulse would have been to slug someone and I don't do it, that's God making a way for me to stay out of jail. <clears throat> Has God ever made a way for you to not enter into petty arguments on Facebook? To just keep on scrolling. Don't even stop. They're ignorant. They don't know what they're talking about. Just keep on scrolling. Facebook, and, 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 and I, I love it because I, I use it for ministry, but you ain't ever changed nobody's mind on Facebook. Getting these ridiculous arguments where we don't even like people anymore, all because of Facebook. Shut that nonsense off. <clears throat> Treat people like they should be treated. Your bond to them as Christians should be better than bond because of this person because they voted for this person or that person. God made a way. He made a way for you to send your kids to a Christian school that you didn't pay a dime to do it. That's God making a way. He made a way for you to be healed when the doctors shook their heads and said, no, it, 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 there ain't no chance. You see, even with this sermon, God is making a way for you. He's making a way for you to make it through the next week. Where there is God, hallelujah, there is a way. So you know when Isaiah said, he who made a way through the waters, Israel's heart skipped. Man, they got excited. Why? Because they were remembering the exodus. The exodus was Israel's legacy. Man, we're special. God parts the waters for us. Water's in your way, God's going to part it. This communicated to Israel. When God says, I'm making a way through the sea, remember that? I delivered you from slavery. I delivered you from sin. And then I dropped you off at a land flowing with milk and honey. God was telling Israel this because he was about to send them into captivity again. But then this, then this verse takes an interesting turn for the worst. It, takes, it makes an interesting turn. Check this out. Suddenly, God says... Forget the former things. 
do not dwell on the past because I want to do a new thing. Right after God mentions the miracle of the Exodus, remember when I made a way through the water. Next words out of his mouth. Remember that? Forget about it. When God says, this is what you've got to get. When God says, you know, we read that, when we isolate that verse, we read, oh, forget the former things. God's talking about my sinful past. He wants me to forget about all those bad things I've done. And yes, God wants you to forget about that. But he's not talking about Israel's past mistakes here. He is talking about Israel's past victories. I hope you know the greatest hindrance to future success in your life and in the church is not past failures, it is past success. Because you become so focused on how God blessed in the past, you miss how he's blessing in the present. Church, God wants to do a new thing in your life. We get so stuck in how it was we miss the blessing of how it is. We get so focused on the memory, we miss the miracle. You see, God wants College Drive to forget what we've done for him last year, and he's asking, what is College Drive doing today? Hallelujah, we planted a church a couple years ago. Well, God wants to do a new thing. You were baptized 30 years ago, hallelujah. But, 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 but what I want to know is what are you doing today to confirm that decision that you have given your life to Jesus Christ? God was telling Israel, never forget that I made a way for you. But don't get so stuck in the way that I made it that you think it's always going to come that way in the future. Because as the high heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways. Higher than your ways and your thoughts than your thoughts. God's saying, I've got ways to deal with your situation that you couldn't even think about even if you tried. In fact, God says through the prophet Habakkuk, talking to the same people, talking about the same thing, exile through Babylon. He says, be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. Don't you see, friends, in order for God to save you, he's going to have to amaze you. He is going to have to shock you into glory. He's going to have to amaze you. This is what the Lord says, he who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters. Yeah, Lord, that's our story. Yes, who drew out the chariots and the horses. I remember that. I remember hearing the story. Remember the army of reinforcements together. Remember that, and I laid there in, in the water, never to rise again. I extinguished them. I snuffed your enemies out like a wick. Yeah, God, that's what I'm talking about. I want you to do that now. I need you to do that right now. The next words out of God's mouth are, I want you to forget the former things. And I want you to stop dwelling on the past. Don't expect deliverance to always look the same. Don't expect it to feel like it used to feel. You see, God wants his church committed to a source and not a system. God wants his people connected to, to a message, not a messenger. Why? Because God wants to do a new thing in this church. God wants to do a new thing in your life. You know, our greatest obstacles in leaving a drought, it is not our, our, our rough past. It is not our circumstances. It isn't what that two-bit ex-spouse of yours did. It is, not, it is not your past or your fear of the future. The greatest reason why you are in a, doubt, a drought today, it is your perception of how God is working in the, the, the here and now. You see, that's why in Isaiah 19, verse 19, God says, now it springs up. Do you not see it? 
Can you not perceive the way I am working dynamically in your life? You see, friends, this tells me Jesus wants to do a new thing in my life right now. Not just when Jesus comes. Hallelujah, when he comes, it's going to be a new thing. But he's wanting to do the new thing in your life now. Christians, you don't put your life on hold uh, to be a real Christian until Jesus comes. <laughs> Jesus doesn't just want you to be baptized because he wants to save you from hell eventually. No, he wants to do a new thing in your life now. He wants to save you from the hell you are living in now. Did you know we're going to be keeping the Sabbath holy in heaven? You can read it in Isaiah 66, 22. So I don't care what the rest of the world does. And I don't care. It may be new. God wants to do a new thing in you now. <laughs> you know, this is going to be a heartbreaker for some of us, but you know we're not going to be eating meat in heaven? <laughs> I hate to break it to you. The Bible says no more death. Lion's going to lay down with the, with the lamb. The, 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 the wolf's going to be eating some grass. Did you know science has proven that a plant-based diet is so much healthier for you? Don't you see God wants to do a new thing in your life, but he wants to do it right now. Man, church, I hope you know you are going to be living in the same neighborhood as every nation, kindred, tongue in heaven, so you better come to terms with that on earth. Because until you let God deal with your prejudice here, God ain't giving you heaven there. Because in heaven, I got bad news for any racists. I looked and behold a great multitude, and no one could number from every nation, from all the tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and the Lamb. Hallelujah! Man, we're going, to be, we're going to be in the same neighborhood, and we're going to be loving each other. So if you say, I can't stand that person, you better deal with it in the here and now. God wants to do a new thing in you now. I'm talking about doing a new thing. New things are hard. New things are hard. New things make you get upset by that reality right now. I can't believe he went there. <clears throat> well, I love you enough to go there. God wants to do a new thing, not an old thing. He wants to do a new thing in your life. You see, what is keeping you from perceiving the new thing God wants to do in your life right now is you're waiting for God to part the Red Sea again. And he's like, I'm not parting the Red Sea again. That's what I did last time. You see, maybe you're expecting to God to make you feel the way you did when you first joined the church. You know how it was. Man, you could just, when you first joined the church, it didn't matter what you were going through. You could open this Bible, and it didn't matter if you turned to Zephaniah or Zechariah or Obadiah. God had a word for you, and you were blessed. You, man, you could have turned to the baguettes and been blessed. <laughs> Seth beget so and so beget so and so beget so what in the world does this tell me it tells us God loves everyone and knows them by name <laughs> that no person has ever been born uh, that God has ever missed them being born that's how it was and so now you want God to speak like that to you but now you open your Bible and you can't seem to find anything that relates to your situation you see, you are expecting God to part the Red Sea again. But God wants to do a new thing. Maybe you've handcuffed yourself to the way the church was 30 years ago. You know what I hear more than anything else since I've been a pastor? Is this. We've never done it like that before. <laughs> but God wants to do a new thing. I don't believe in change just to change. That's silliness. 
But friend, and, and, and the gospel never changes, amen? The message doesn't change, but sometimes the way we deliver the message changes. And, and, and I want to be clear, there is nothing wrong with looking back lovingly and nostalgically. We all do that. That's what Israel is doing when they're talking about the Red Sea. They're looking back on when they were alone in the wilderness with God. It was like a date. It was like a honeymoon. Friends, we always romanticize the past. No Israelite who was alive during the Exodus felt that way in the desert. We, we remember the good things, we forget all the bad things. We always romanticize the past. There's nothing wrong with looking back on our past lovingly, as long as you're not missing what God is wanting to do in the church today. You see, because deliverance looks and feels different, Israel is falsely assuming that God is not there. You do know that's why Elijah ended up in the desert. Friends, if you missed any of the sermons in this series, I highly recommend you go back online, collegedrivechurch.com, and, and listen to all, part, part one through three. This is why Elijah ended up in the desert. The rain fell, but it didn't fall on Elijah. Why? Because it didn't happen the way he expected it to happen, and so he throws up his hands and he gives up. He says, oh, I'm the only one. God's like, I got 7,000 more. You want in on this? Then, then go. No, I got 7,000 to pick from. Because it didn't happen the way he expected it to happen, he throws up his hands, he isolates himself. Suddenly, he's got the woe is me, pity pot, USA. God wants to do a new thing in College Drive this year. Last year's accomplishments will not meet today's needs. It doesn't matter what you did in your relationship with God three years ago. What are you doing today to get to know Jesus more? Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? When God delivered Israel at the Red Sea, check this out. When God delivers them at the Red Sea, the water was the barrier. Remember? Red Sea in front, Egyptians in the back. The Red Sea was the barrier. But then he made a way through the waters, and the water became a wall, a barrier on both sides. But now, he says, I'm going to make a pathway through the what? This time, I'm going I'm to create rivers in the dry wasteland. Check this out. What used to be the barrier has now become the blessing. Water in the wilderness. You see, friends, one day, most of you just didn't get that. One person got that. Uh, let me tell you again. What used to be the, the barrier has now been the blessing. One day, when you step on street paved with gold and Jesus gives you a crown, I, I, we're going to thank God for the hard times as much as the good times because we realize that it was in the hard times that Jesus woke us up. Uh, you see, the barrier has become the blessing. You see, if God can turn water into dry land, and he can turn dry land into water, that means he can take your pain, and he can turn it into patience. He can take your heartache, and he can turn it into holiness. He can take your abuse, and he can turn it into strength. He can take your disappointment, and he can turn it into determination. He can take you from faith listness to faithfulness help listness to hope man he can even turn death into life because you see god is a way maker hallelujah friends our god is a way maker and if you're going to leave the drought today you got to let him do a new thing and you need to know that god's new thing is better than your old thing that his new way is better than your old way. You got to believe the next five years at College Drive are going to be better than the last five years. And I believe it, friends. You got to believe the next 20 years in your marriage, married folk, are going to be better than the last 20 years. 
You, you got to believe, Christians, that your next year with God is better than all your years without him. When it comes to God, what's coming is always better than what was. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Can you see it? When God delivered Israel from Egypt, he sent Moses. But friends, this time God was going to send his son. Do you believe what's coming is better than what's not, what was last? <laughs> Hebrews says long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. You see, Elijah was good and Elisha was good and Moses was good and these people were great, yeah. But in these last days he's spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom he created what? The world. Hallelujah, what's coming? Is always better than what was but what is so tragic about Israel's story is they never left their drought most of them did not you see because Israel kept looking for another Moses they missed God for truly I say to you many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and they did not see it and they wanted to hear what you are hearing and they did not hear it they hear Father Abraham rejoice that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. But you have missed the time of your visitation. You are so stuck in your past that you cannot see what I'm doing today. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have what? You don't want to leave your drought. You see, when we lock God into working only a certain way and at a certain time and a certain method, we miss all the mighty work God wants to do today. And when you read Isaiah from the cross backwards, you see almost every other verse, God's new way. It's there. It's already there. In Isaiah 43, a voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. What, what makes straight in the desert a highway uh, for our God? That was the cry of John the Baptist before Jesus shows up on the scene. In Isaiah 42, 1, behold my servant whom I uphold, who I've chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the nations. And when you read Matthew 12, 18 through 20, Jesus quotes that and he says, that's me. Don't you see Jesus is your way out of the drought? Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. We may not know how God's going to do what he said. But you know what? I've discovered something in life. We don't need to know the how when we got the who. You don't need to know how he's going to do it when you got the who is going to do it. Where there is Jesus, hallelujah, there is a what? A way. But you got to stop looking backwards, friends, and you got to look to Jesus. You got to quit reminiscing about the good times. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of that. But don't keep that locked into what God wants to do tomorrow and the next day. Stop thinking that because you turned 70 this year, your best years are behind you. I believe your best years are ahead of you. Don't think that because your kids have moved out of the house, mothers, that God can no longer use you. He says, I'm doing a new thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a new thing in this town. I'm going to do a new thing in this church I'm gonna do a new thing in your marriage and I'm gonna do a new thing in your life no it's not easy for God to do a new thing in you because we're stubborn and there are plenty of obstacles you are gonna face and barriers from your from God's blessing man as we saw God's gonna have to rewire your brain he's gonna have to create a whole new road system in your head But you need to get something today. If you are in Christ, your greatest obstacles have already been overcome. Romans 5.5 5 says, this hope does not put us to shame. Shame should no longer paralyze you, church. 2 Corinthians 12.10 says, for when I am weak, then I am what? Your weaknesses should no longer inhibit you, church. 
First Peter 1, 23 says, For you have been born again, not of perishable, but of imperishable, through the living and the enduring word of God. If you've been born again, why do you keep bringing up your past? God wants to do a new thing in your life today. Yes, our iniquities did bring separation between us and God. But check this out. Jesus healed the separation. Jesus has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Nothing, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Your greatest barriers are already broken. Your greatest battles are already won. Your greatest hopes are already materializing. Can you see them? They're springing forth now. Let God do a new thing in your life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the awesome God that you are. Make us, mold us, change us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.